because time is a label. Time is a way of finding yourself in the universe. When you're told there's a really cool lecture you want to go to, you're told two pieces of information, where it is and when it's going to happen. So time is a dimension, it's a number, and that makes it very simple. But there's also something fundamentally different about time versus space, because time has a direction. Here in the room, space seems to have a direction, namely, you can tell the difference between up and down. Down is the direction in which things fall when you drop them. But you don't think that that's like some deep, important feature of the fundamental architecture of reality. It's just a local phenomenon because the Earth is right there, pulling on things. If you were an astronaut out there in space, floating far away from anything, there would be no difference between up, down, left, right, forward, backward. All the different directions of space would seem to be created equal to you. But it's obvious that there's a direction of time. The past and future, or the two ways you can imagine moving in time, are utterly different from each other. So we call that difference the arrow of time. It manifests itself in many ways, whether it's automobiles, uh, pop singers, or society itself. These things change with time in sort of coherent ways. When I show you these pictures, whether or not you're a car aficionado, you know which one was from the past and which one is from the present, and so forth. <laughs> There's certain ways we tend to age, and so forth. You know, these are just kind of predictable things. We don't yet have this car, but I'm sure it's happening anytime soon. So, the arrow of time, the fact that evolution from the past through the present to the future has a preferred direction that is sort of consistent in many different ways, is a deep feature of the world. You might want to understand it better. So let's think about the different ways that it does manifest itself. All of us in this room share the feature that when we were born, we were younger. And in the future, we will be older. <coughs> or we were all babies when we were young, and we age in a certain particular, consistent, predictable way, unless you are Benjamin Button. That's the only <laughs> known counterexample. We remember the past, but we don't remember the future. We can predict the future. But I hope that nobody in this room has a memory of the future, or let me know, because we can get rich together, if you have memories of the future. <laughs> we don't have photographs of the future, fossil records of the future, anything like that. We do, we think, have the ability to make a choice now that will affect the future. You could choose right now to say, ha, huh, this is a boring lecture, I will now leave. You cannot choose right now to say, ha, huh, this was always going to have been a boring lecture, I will not have come. You can't make that choice. You cannot change the past by making a choice right now. And that's reflected in our notions of cause and effect. We think that the cause happens first, the effect happens later. If you move your elbow and you bump a glass of wine and it falls to the floor, you say, the cause of the wine glass falling was my elbow hitting it. You do not say, the cause of me moving my elbow was that the wine glass was going to fall, something had to move it like that. That's not how it works. Now, all of this is so natural and ingrained and obvious that we almost don't think of it. If you were sort of, say, an ancient Greek thinker about the nature of reality, the arrow of time was not a puzzle that you were confronting. There was just a big difference between the past and future. The past has already happened, and the future hasn't happened yet. Obviously, they're different. But then a little thing comes along called physics. In particular, the laws of physics that we get from Newton or uh, Laplace or anyone like that. We have this idea that when you look at the deep down laws of physics, they tend to have the property that they don't distinguish between the past and the future. There is no arrow of time in the deep down laws of physics. So for example, if you have a billiard table and two balls bump into each other and scatter off, we're imagining this is a physicist billiard table, so there's no friction, no noise, no dissipation. So there's a scattering experiment, and let's say you make a movie of this. Then you play the movie backwards to someone. Nobody will be able to tell whether you are playing that movie forward or backward. According to the rules of microscopic fundamental physics, for every way that things can happen in one direction of time, they can happen in exactly the backwards direction as well. Same thing is true for that pendulum rocking back and forth. Same thing is true for the planets moving around the sun. And this is true whether or not you're Isaac Newton 
or James Clark Maxwell, or Albert Einstein, or Ed Whitney. All of our best attempts at making fundamental laws of physics have the property that the past and future are treated equally. So how can it be that one of the most obvious features of our everyday world is the profound difference between past and future? And yet, our best description of the world at a deep level makes no difference between past and future. We don't know all the details, but it clearly has something to do with the difference between a small number of moving pieces, just a couple of balls bumping into each other, versus large macroscopic objects. Once we get to the macroscopic world of many, many molecules of water, for example, we experience behaviors that seem to be irreversible. They happen in one direction of time, but not the other. If you start with a glass of cool water or warm water with an ice cube, they both evolve into a glass of cool water. Therefore, if I just tell you you have a glass of cool water right now, and I say, play the movie backwards, where did that come from? Based on macroscopic information alone, you don't have a unique answer. Maybe it came from a glass of cool water. Maybe it came from a glass of warm water. Macroscopic behaviors in the world seem to not be reversible in the same way that the microscopic laws are. So clearly, this has something to do with the actual configuration of stuff in the universe. So the first step towards a scientific understanding of this is to invent jargon. And the jargon we invent is entropy. Entropy is the concept illustrated here. This is a typical collegiate demonstration of entropy. On the left, you have what your room used to look like. And on the right, you have what your room will look like in the near future. Entropy is a way of characterizing how messy or disorderly or disorganized a collection of stuff is, whether it's the molecules in a glass of water, or cream mixing into coffee, or the stuff that is the books and the papers that are in your room. Left to their own, things go from a configuration of low entropy, orderly and nicely arranged, toward a configuration of higher entropy. Leave your room by its lonesome, or don't try very hard to fix it, it will naturally become messy. I'm sure I do not have to tell you. <laughs> Left it all by itself, if you start with a messy room, it will never clean itself up. Sorry about that. This is a fundamental law of nature. The rooms do not clean themselves up. We call this law the second law of thermodynamics. It's the sexiest of the laws of thermodynamics. The first law just says that energy is conserved. To be honest, I don't even remember the zero and the third laws ever. The second law, though, this is one of the best laws in all of physics. The second law says that entropy, disorderliness, randomness, mixed upness, increases or at best remains constant in closed systems over time. Of course, you're allowed to clean your room. You are often encouraged to clean your room. You can lower the entropy of things. You take a bottle of wine and put it in the refrigerator, it will get cooler and its entropy will go down. But that's because it is not in a closed system. Left to themselves, objects in the universe get messier. Their entropy increases. An unbroken egg is a very exquisitely orderly arranged low entropy system. It is very, very easy to turn that into a broken egg or into scrambled eggs. It is very difficult, in fact, never happens in human experience to turn the scrambled eggs back into an unbroken egg. So this gives a relationship between time and entropy. Namely, that as time goes from the past to the future, entropy increases. This is one manifestation of the arrow of time. And one of the points I want to make in the lecture is, this is the single thing that underlies all the different manifestations of the arrow of time. Memory, causality, aging, it's all because entropy is increasing. And to get there, we need some understanding of what entropy really is. Our modern under understanding was handed down by this guy, Ludwig Boltzmann. Now, Boltzmann, as far as I'm concerned, this is his tombstone in Vienna. He really achieved what every single physicist should aspire to achieve. Namely, he has an equation on his tombstone. <laughs> I always tell the students that I have, what you should always be thinking. What is the equation that will be on my tombstone someday? I hope it's an equation that I think of myself, not one that I borrow from Bolton. But you're welcome to learn. Use this one if you like. 
The equation on Boltzmann's tombstone is Boltzmann's definition of entropy. Now, the idea of entropy had already been around. There was sort of a, it, it's an interesting little bit of the intersection between science, technology, and nationalism in the 19th century. The, uh, in the early 1800s, the French were upset because the British kept building better steam engines than they did. So a French engineer, Sanji Carnot, in his very typically French way, said, what would be the world's perfect steam engine? And what he showed is that even the best possible steam engine would necessarily be inefficient to some degree. It would waste heat. There's some loss of usable energy. It was Rudolf Clausius who formalized Carnot's relation into something called the growth of entropy. And it was Boltzmann after that who tried to define entropy. So what he means by that is, Boltzmann in the 1870s and some of his friends, Maxwell, Gibbs, Thompson, these were physicists who believed that the world was made of atoms. It was not a common belief among physicists at the time. The chemists had already caught on that the world was made of atoms, but physicists were hamstrung by bad philosophy. There were physicists like Ernst Bach who said, as physicists, we shouldn't talk about atoms because you can't see them. It is an untestable, unfalsifiable hypothesis, and such hypotheses should have no role in explaining the world that we do see. Stop me if this sounds familiar from more modern context. But Boltzmann and his friends said, even though we can't see the atoms, they help explain features of the world that we do see. In particular, Boltzmann said, if you grant me atoms, then I don't need to postulate the growth of entropy as an independent law of nature. I can derive it from the behavior of the atoms. So imagine, for example, cream and coffee. This, by the way, if you're, if you're an applied physicist, you know this can't be cream and coffee because cream does not float on top of coffee. This is vanilla liqueur and some mm. terrible black coffee liqueur. It tastes terrible anyway. So, but it looks like cream and coffee, and the point is that Boltzmann says, if I believe this is made of atoms, or molecules, we would now say, for cream and coffee, then when I look at that, I don't see the individual atoms and molecules. I see the cream and the coffee. So what that means is that there are many different ways I could arrange the individual atoms and molecules that would look the same to me. There's a certain number of ways I could sort of exchange various cream molecules for other cream molecules. Or, I could exchange various coffee molecules with other coffee molecules. And it would look the same macroscopically. What I can't do is start interchanging cream and coffee amongst themselves, because then I could tell the difference. So there's a certain counting you can do of the number of ways that you could arrange the cream molecules and the coffee molecules, and that is this number, W. Arrangements that look the same macroscopically. In the higher entropy configuration, there are many, many more ways to arrange the individual molecules that look the same macroscopically. So, if you're, if you're shown this progression from that picture to that picture to that picture, you know that time moves from left to right, just from your everyday experience. Entropy is increasing. What Boltzmann says is that the reason why entropy increases from here to here, and never decreases, no matter how much you stir, the coffee and cream are not going to unmix themselves, is simply because there are many, many more ways to arrange the atoms and molecules in a high entropy configuration than a low entropy one. The fact that entropy increases over time is not an absolute law, it is a statistical law. It is overwhelmingly probable that if you start in a low entropy configuration, you will evolve toward a high entropy one because there are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. So that is the reason, Boltzmann says, for the second law. It's simply a matter of counting. So to some extent, that counts as an explanation for why entropy tends to increase, right? And Boltzmann himself thought this was an explanation. There were wonderful, engaged, physical, philosophical debates in the late 19th century about whether or not this really counted as an explanation. And I can give you the very short answer. No, it didn't really. It halfway counts as an explanation. So the point is, 
think of all of the different possible configurations of stuff, and then divide those configurations into what are called macro states by two states are in the same macro state that they look the same macroscopically. High entropy macro states have many little states in them, low entropy ones have just a few. So Boltzmann is correct when he says that if you start in a low entropy state and just wander off in beta space, with overwhelming probability, you will end up in a high entropy state. The problem is, why do you start in a low entropy state to begin with? If you start in a random place, it is enormously more likely you just start with high entropy. So what Boltzmann is doing is explaining why, starting today, the entropy of the universe will be higher tomorrow. It tends to go up. But his logic would also imply that the entropy of the universe was higher yesterday. If all you know is that, let's say, you're in this intermediate entropy state here, most of your futures go to higher entropy, but most of your pasts come from higher entropy as well. You have not completely explained the real world in which we think the entropy of the universe was lower in the past. So I'll, I'll let you think for two seconds about the question, given the entropy of the universe today, why was the entropy of the universe lower yesterday? Okay, now we tell you the answer. It's because the entropy of the universe was even lower the day before yesterday. And you might say, that's not very fair. Why was the entropy of the universe lower the day before yesterday? And the answer is because it was even lower the day before that. And this is it. This is the correct answer. There's no dynamical reason. This is a fact about the universe. And this logic goes back 13.8 billion years to the Big Bang. The reason why entropy has been increasing for the past 14 billion years of the history of the universe is not because of the fundamental deep down microscopic laws of physics, it's because of an initial condition near the Big Bang. So we call this the past hypothesis, the fact that the early universe started in a state of very, very low entropy. And what it means is that the explanation for the arrow of time in our observed universe is very analogous to the explanation for the arrow of space here in this room. Remember, we tell the difference between up and down. There's an arrow of space, a preferred direction. Not because of the deep down laws, but because we live in the vicinity of an influential object, namely the Earth. Likewise, the reason for the arrow of time, a preferred direction in time, is not because of the deep down laws of physics, but because we live in the aftermath of an, of an influential event, namely the Big Bang. That Big Bang is what set up the universe for all of its subsequent evolution and its increase in entropy. So that explains why entropy is increasing if you grant me that the Big Bang had a very, very low entropy. It does not explain why the Big Bang had such a low entropy. That is now a job for cosmology. And again, to sort of leap ahead and tell you what the answer is, nobody has any idea. It's an open question. I have tried to figure out the answer. I have some good ideas. I will share you some ideas. But I might not be right. And if so, I'm very, very close to that age where physicists reach where their good ideas are gone. So my job here is to remind people this is a really crucially important problem so that some young person in the audience will solve this problem. And then when you're giving your Nobel Prize acceptance speech, you will remember this lecture. You'll say, that was the time when I really got interested in understanding why the entropy of the Big Bang was so small. So this past hypothesis, the small entropy of the Big Bang, I claim explains all of the arrows of time. So I'm not going to go through all the different possibilities, but let me give you one example. What a philosopher would call the asymmetry of epistemic access to the past and the future. The fact that we remember the past and not the future. The fact that we remember the past and not the future is not some mystical property of our brains. You could make it a statement about artifacts here in the world. We have photographs of the past. We have records of the past in a way that we don't have records of the future. So why is there this imbalance between past and future? So I'd like to examine this particular model system called the broken egg. Imagine you're walking down the street one day, and on the sidewalk you see a broken egg. Your first thought is, ha, huh, I must be in a physics lecture. And those guys love talking about eggs and breaking them, and that's what happens. So what I want you to do is think about the possible future evolutions 
of that egg. It might just sit there for a long time. A rainstorm might come by and wash it away. A dog might come by and eat it, or some person cleans it up. There's a possibility, although it's very, very, very tiny, that the random motions of the egg might reassemble it into an unbroken egg. It's not going to happen with overwhelming probability, but it could happen. Now ask yourself, well, what about the past evolutions of the egg? If you only looked at the fundamental deep down microscopic laws of physics, the set of all past trajectories or evolutions of the egg is exactly the same, exactly as big as the set of all the possible future evolutions. But in your mind, you know that one of them is overwhelmingly the likely one, namely that this used to be an unbroken egg and someone dropped it. How do you know? What is it that gives you this enormous leverage over all the possible things that could have happened to the egg in the past? The answer is that secretly, implicitly, deep down, you know that the Big Bang started with a low entropy. You know that there's a boundary condition very, very far in the past when you look for trajectories that are consistent both with what we know today and the low entropy past that picks out a certain reconstruction in between. Given the low entropy Big Bang and the evidence of the egg on the sidewalk, you infer the existence of an unbroken egg in the past. That is a model for how all kinds of memory work, and they always rely on this past hypothesis. So what we want to do today is explain why the early universe had a low entropy. Why was it like that? So since not all of you are professional cosmologists, I will show you what the real early universe was actually like. This is a photograph taken of the universe one second after the Big Bang. So it looks like that. This is, all right, you're not laughing. You should be laughing now. You're not laughing. It's not really a photograph. It's just a white slide, okay? Why? Because one second after the Big Bang, the universe was completely featureless. It was hot. It was dense. It was smooth. It was rapidly expanding. It was so hot that it was radiating to beat the band at all the different wavelengths it's possible to radiate at. And it looks the same in all directions. The Big Bang is not a point, an object in some pre-existing space-time. It is the beginning of the whole universe. So it does not look like some explosion seen from far away. If you've ever seen an image like that of the Big Bang, you know you're being lied to. This is what it looks like because this is what the inside of the universe view would look like. And I picked one second because we have no idea what happens at zero seconds after the Big Bang. We have no idea what happens at what we actually call the Big Bang. That's the moment when our understanding of the universe fails us. We need a quantum theory of gravity to make sense of that. We can make guesses and hypotheses, but if people tell you things like, the Big Bang is the beginning of the universe, there's nothing before the Big Bang, talking about before the Big Bang is like talking about what's north of the North Pole, etc., 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 you are being lied to. We don't know what happened before the Big Bang. So for one second, it looks like this. Then you let things go, and what happens is the universe expands, dilutes, and cools. So at this snapshot, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, this is the time, the moment in the history of the universe when it becomes transparent. Earlier than this moment, it was so hot that you couldn't make atoms. Electrons were slamming into other electrons with such energy that they didn't get to stick to atomic nuclei and make entire unionized atoms. After this time, it's cool enough that what happens is called recombination. The electrons join up with the protons and with other nuclei and make atoms. And at that point, the universe is now transparent. Before then, the photons kept bumping into the electrons, the free electrons, and they didn't get very far, you would not be able to see your hand in front of your face. After this point, photons can free stream for 14 billion years and land in some telescope in orbit around the Earth. So this is an image from the Planck satellite, one of those telescopes in orbit around the Earth. And what you see is that the universe has become a little bit more lumpy. Unlike my previous picture, this really is data, this is really an image, but it is greatly enhanced, these differences in color represent differences in temperature of one part in 100,000. Tiny, tiny differences in temperature from place to place. But those differences in temperature reflect real differences in the density and temperature of matter in the universe. 
And what this means is that gravity has begun its inexorable work. What gravity does is, if there's a region where there's a slightly over-dense region, slightly more particles in this part of the universe than somewhere else, then gravity pulls particles toward that region. And in slightly emptier regions, they empty out. So gravity works to gradually turn up the contrast knob of the universe, going from perfectly smooth to a little bit lumpy to our universe today, which looks like this. This is a, an excerpt from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. These are individual galaxies. We live in the Milky Way galaxy, a galaxy with about 100 billion stars of order of magnitude. And we live in a universe with about 100 billion galaxies. And the age of the universe is 100 billion if you measure it in dog years. So I don't know what the significance of that is, but for dogs, 100 billion is the only number you need to know when it comes to the universe. Every one of these little spots, like that little red spot right there, is a galaxy roughly the same size as our Milky Way, hundreds of billions of stars, or at least tens of millions of stars, tens of billions of stars. Half of them probably have planets. There's a very large chance that right there, there are many institutes of technology where they're having lectures and they're looking at pictures of us, <laughs> wondering if they know as much about the Big Bang as we do. So, in most cosmology lectures, the, the, the history of the universe would end there. The implicit idea being that we are the culmination of cosmic evolution. So I'm here to burst your bubble. The universe is going to continue evolving after today. And so since we're trying to treat the past and future on an equal footing, we should keep going into the future. So we don't have photographs of the future, but here's what the universe will look like one quadrillion years from the Big Bang. One quadrillion years, 10 to the 15, is chosen because that's the time after which all of the stars will have fizzled out. We live in a universe that is bright with starlight right now, but those stars have a finite amount of time to burn their fuel. So once the last star burns out, we live in a universe that has nothing in it but black holes and rocks. Rocks in the sense of planets and dead stars. So this is a dark and lonely universe, but it's still not done evolving. So what's going to happen is those rocks are going to fall into the black holes. And then we live in a universe with nothing but black holes. And the black holes will fall into each other, and you get left with a few supermassive black holes moving away from each other. But even that's not the end, because Stephen Hawking taught us in the 1970s that even black holes give off radiation. Black holes very, very gradually leak out their energy into the surrounding universe in the form of very, very, very low energy photons and other particles. It takes a long time, but eventually even those black holes will completely evaporate away. So the final picture is this photograph of the universe 10 to the 100 years after the Big Bang, when the last black hole has evaporated. This is the number that, when I was your age, we called it a Google. These days, the word has been taken over by the search engine, but the word 10 to the 100 is attached to the, the number 10 to the 100 is attached to the word Google. And all that's left in the universe is nothing at all, empty space. In 1998, we discovered that the universe is not only expanding, but accelerating. The distant galaxies are moving away from us faster and faster. So we believe that acceleration caused by what's called dark energy will never stop. We don't know for sure, it's a matter of predicting the future, but the simplest model says this will simply continue forever. The universe will not recollapse, it will empty out, get more and more dark, cold, and lonely. That is your future. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> here to bring the truth. I'm not here to make you feel <laughs> However, this story, as wonderful as it is, raises a question that also pops up in other contexts. So here is the history of the universe from one second to ten to one hundred years. Here we are in the middle on this sort of quasi-logarithmic scale. So, sometimes you will hear the question raised if the universe's history is just a story of entropy increasing, of more and more disorder and chaos and randomness, how is it conceivable that something as exquisitely complex and orderly as human beings or other life forms here on Earth could have arisen out of undirected, mindless evolution? So part of that answer to that is that, you know, the Earth is not a closed system. The second law of thermodynamics does not say that the entropy of the Earth has to either increase or decrease. It's an open system exchanging energy with its environment. But 
That explanation doesn't explain still why, even if it's allowed, why it actually did happen that complex structures arose here on Earth. But that's because you're confusing entropy with complexity or simplicity. So if you look at this picture, the first picture, one second after the Big Bang, this is very, very low entropy. But it's also extremely simple, right? I mean, literally, it's a white rectangle. That's it. If you look at the last picture, 10 to the 100 years, it is now high entropy. There's a lot more phase space because everything is expanded away from everything else. But it is also extremely simple. It is a black rectangle. These could be the same picture, just with the color you know, balance change. It's in between, where the entropy was in the midst of increasing, that the universe looks complex. We actually live in the exciting part of the history of the universe, where stars are burning, where there's interesting structure, where there are galaxies and planets and all this interesting stuff going on. So although entropy just increases, 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 Complexity increases and then decreases for a while. And this is robust <coughs> behavior in closed systems. The same thing happened in the cup of coffee. On the left, low entropy, but simple. All the cream on top, all the coffee on the bottom. On the right, high entropy, but simple again. Everything is mixed up. In the middle is where it got complex. The tendrils of the cream are mixing in a fractal pattern with the coffee, and it requires more information in the technical sense to tell you what is happening there in the middle. This is robust behavior. Complexity is not the enemy of entropy or vice versa. The appearance of complexity relies on the fact that entropy is increasing from a low part to a high part. The fact that there's life on Earth is not just consistent with the second law, it's because of the second law. And again, you can make that a little bit more quantitative. This is a uh, hydrothermal alkaline vent, lost city formation underneath the uh, Atlantic Ocean, a likely place where things that, the things that are going on there can resemble the first appearance of life on Earth. Of course, we don't know what happened when life appeared on Earth. But here's one popular theory. This is a theory by Mike Russell, scientist at JPL. I sat next to Mike, I, I met him for the first time on an airplane. I was reading a physics paper, and he said, oh yes, I'm familiar with that. Usually when that happens on an airplane, I just avoid whatever the person has to say next. But in this case, we chit-chatted, and he goes, oh yes, I can tell you what the purpose of life is. <laughs> Again, when people say that, you don't ask further questions. But in this case, I humored him. All right, purpose of life. The purpose of life is to hydrogenate carbon dioxide, is what he said. That's not most people's view. But <laughs> What he has in mind is, in the early conditions of the Earth, in the Hadean period, before there was anything more than just rocks and stuff, there was, in his view, a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of hydrogen, which, relatively speaking, is a low entropy configuration. You can take the same basic constituents and make it into a much higher entropy configuration if you can turn that carbon dioxide into methane, into stripping it of its oxygen and replacing them with hydrogen. The problem is that the intermediate steps decrease the entropy first rather than increasing it. So there's no easy path from carbon dioxide <coughs> down to methane. There's a complex path that requires a series of metabolic reactions catalyzed in various intricate ways. So Russell's theory is that the precursor to life was a series of chemical proto-metabolic pathways that could take advantage of the low entropy environment it was in, and eventually sort of got so greedy that it broke free of the porous rock that it was born in, got inside a cell membrane, and kept on going. This is what is called the metabolism first theory, in contrast with the replication first theory. Nobody knows what the right theory is, but the point is that life, in this view, is simply an outgrowth of this system's desire, if you want to put it that way, to increase its entropy. And then once you get life going, I know this is a bit of a sidelight, but you know, you're a captive audience, what can you do? <laughs> once you get life going, it feeds off the increase of entropy. There's a wonderful little book written by Erwin Schrodinger, the famous physicist, author of the Schrodinger Equation, 
being this killer and torturer of cats. <laughs> In his book called What is Life, Schrodinger says, life is something that keeps moving long after it should have stopped, or long after you would have expected that it stopped. So a goldfish, put a goldfish in a bowl of water, put a rock in the bowl of water, it'll just sit there and won't do anything, put an ice cube in the bowl of water, it will just melt, put a goldfish in the bowl of water, it will die, if, if it's my goldfish, but <laughs> if you feed the goldfish, it can keep going for a really long time. What is, what is going on there? What's going on is that the food you give the goldfish is, is energy, free energy, energy in a concentrated, low entropy form. And the goldfish increases the entropy of the stuff you give it, and as, by doing that, manages to maintain its integrity and mobility. This is in microcosm what happens here on the Earth. This is a little sketch by a famous artist who I think gave an earlier lecture in this series, Roger Penrose. This is a picture of the Earth's biosphere. You know, we get light from the sun. If you ask someone, what has the sun ever done for us? You might be told, well, you know, the sun gives us energy. We get energy from the sun, right? But that's not exactly right, because we give back to the universe almost exactly the same amount of energy we get from the sun. The difference is we get light from the sun in the visible spectrum. We radiate it in the infrared. For every one photon we get from the sun, we give 20 photons back to the universe, each with 1 20th of the energy on average, which means we have increased the entropy of that radiation by a factor of 20. We get low entropy energy from the sun because the sun is a bright spot in a cold sky. We use it to photosynthesize, to chew our cud, to take lecture notes and things like that, and then we radiate it back out in the universe with much higher energy. We use up the free energy of the universe, increasing its energy, and to do that, by doing that, we manage to stay alive and do our activities. All right, enough of this squishy science stuff with biology and so forth. <laughs> Let's get back to where we belong. Cosmology. All right, where were we? We said that the reason why entropy has been increasing over the whole history of the universe is a combination of Boltzmann's insight there are more ways to be high entropy than low entropy. With the past hypothesis, the idea that the entropy was very low near the Big Bang. So that's the job, the challenge to cosmologists. Why was the past hypothesis true? Now, Boltzmann was no dummy, right? He knew about this. So he proposed an idea. This is one of those ideas he proposed that is so embarrassing, even as you propose it, that Boltzmann blamed it on his assistant, Dr. Schutz. <laughs> but we now know it as Boltzmann's uh, idea. And the idea is this, remember Boltzmann in the, 18, in the 19th uh, century, he didn't know about general relativity or quantum mechanics or the Big Bang or anything like that. He thought the universe was eternal, Newtonian, absolute space, absolute time. There were particles bumping into each other and it was infinitely old. If that's true, you expect the universe to usually be in thermal equilibrium, has an infinite time to equilibrate. It's like a box of gas that has reached equilibrium. But because he was Boltzmann, he knew that starting from equilibrium, the maximum entropy state, there would be occasional rare fluctuations down to lower entropy configurations, which would then relax back. It's just the statement that in this room, if you take the air in this room and box it up and leave it there forever, there will occasionally be fluctuations when all the air molecules rush to one half of the room and then rush back. You can calculate the time it will take on average for that to happen much, much larger than the age of the universe. But if you have infinitely long to wait, it will eventually happen with probability one. So Boltzmann invents two ideas, which are now beloved by contemporary cosmologists, the anthropic principle and the multiverse. What he says is the universe is infinitely big and infinitely old, and most of the time it's in equilibrium. But if you wait long enough, in different little regions, there will be fluctuations to lower entropy states. And if you wait very, very, very long, because you have infinitely long to wait, there will be a huge fluctuation into what he says is the size of our Milky Way galaxy, what was considered at the time to be our entire world. So he says the anthropic, we didn't, he didn't call it the anthropic principle, but he says very explicitly, most of the universe is dead. He knew that you couldn't have life without an increase of entropy, a departure from equilibrium. 
You can only have life in those rare parts of the universe where entropy has gone down and then will come back up again. So there's a selection of that. You will only find observers in those parts of his Boltzmannian <coughs> multiverse where the entropy is temporarily very low. Therefore, it is not surprising, says Boltzmann, that we find ourselves in a small part of the giant universe that is hospitable to the emergence of life. It turns out this was not his original idea. He's not the first one to say that. If you go back into the literature, the first example I could find was 50 BC. This is Lucretius, a Roman poet who, like Holtzman, was an atomist. He was stuck with the problem of explaining the emergence of order and complexity in a world that was just atoms <coughs> bumping into each other. So he says this, you have to imagine this is in Latin, in dactylic hexameter, but uh, <laughs> what he says is, surely the atoms do not hold counsel assigning order to each, flexing their keen minds with questions of place and motion and who goes where. So this is ancient Roman sarcasm. <laughs> Rather, they shuffled and jumbled in many ways. And in the course of endless time, they are buffeted, driven along, chancing upon all motions and combinations. At last, they fall into such an arrangement as would create this universe. It's exactly Boltzmann's idea. You have a bunch of atoms bumping into each other. Wait long enough, the universe will look like this. Fortunately, this Boltzmann-Lucretia scenario is 100% wrong. We know it's not right. Don't fear that we are all just a big random fluctuation. So this was pointed out by this guy, Arthur Eddington, in the 1930s. And what he did is kind of what Boltzmann should have done when he proposed the idea. He thought about it a little more quantitatively. He ran the numbers. So Eddington says, of course, in thermal equilibrium, there will be occasional fluctuations to lower entropy states. But we know how frequently they happen. We know that small fluctuations happen more frequently than large fluctuations. In fact, for you scientists in the room, they, the probability goes as e to the minus delta s, where delta s is the change in entropy. So if you have many, many such fluctuations and you're waiting for something particular to happen, like the emergence of intelligent life, or a single intelligent conscious observer, then the question you should ask yourself is, what is the minimum kind of fluctuation I should get, or I need to have, in order to reach that condition? And Eddington says, you're not going to get, you're not going to wait until you fluctuate through the whole Milky Way galaxy. You don't need all those other stars in our galaxy to explain us. You would do perfectly fine just with fluctuating into the solar system. And then he says, you know, he didn't say these words, we're paraphrasing here. He says, you know, for that matter, I don't need all you guys. I can just wait for one me to fluctuate into existence. It is overwhelmingly likely that most people in this situation are all alone in the universe. And then, in fact, if what we really just want is some conscious observer, some information processing system, that observer doesn't even need to have a body. It just needs to be enough atoms to make a brain that sort of lives long enough to look around and go, ha, huh, thermal equilibrium, and then die. <laughs> so the overwhelming majority of observers in this Boltzmannian, Lucretian, fluctuating universe are disembodied brains that live for a little couple seconds and then die. These are now called Boltzmann brains. This is an, an image from the New York Times which mislabels the idea. It's not Boltzmann's brain. Boltzmann's brain is underneath the tombstone. But the equation on it. This is a Boltzmann brain. Now, you have to get the logic right. You know, why is this not the universe we live in? We're not saying this is a good idea. We're saying it's the wrong idea. And in fact, there's a complicated philosophical argument. The point is that Forgetting about Boltzmann brains, imagine you fluctuate into this room with us in it. So I include the room, I include all of us really being here, our mental states that we think that there is stuff outside the world. In this scenario, given the existence of this room, it is still overwhelmingly likely the rest of the universe is empty and in thermal equilibrium. And in fact, all of our impressions of what is true outside, our, our reasoning about the laws of physics and math and logic, randomly fluctuated into our brain. So it cannot be true that this scenario is simultaneously correct and gives us good reason to think it is correct. So we reject this scenario and try to look for better things. Now there were readers of the article in the New York Times that did not quite appreciate this bit of logic. So those of us like me who were quoted in the article 
got a little piece of hate mail uh, from young George Wayne. George is 10 years old. He was very upset at this article. He was agitated, so his handwriting wasn't very good, so I wanted to translate a little bit. So George writes, I don't know if you exist, but I do. I do not agree with your article, and I do not believe that mumbo jumbo. If you do, well, it's a disturbing thought, but I know how to deal with it. I will not let the world disappear under my nose, but if you do, I can't say I'm sorry. <laughs> Sincerely, a ten-year-old who knows a little more than some people, George Wayne. <laughs> P.S. Some people have a little too much time. <laughs> So I'm waiting for the future time when George has grown up and applies to graduate school at Caltech. So I told him for being impertinent when he was like <laughs> He needs not worry. We're not saying that we didn't watch way into existence. We say, we're saying that we couldn't have and we need to do better. So how can we do better? Well, one of the lessons one learns by giving many public talks is that one's credibility always goes up if you show a picture of Carl Sagan. <laughs> I like to use this picture, this quote from Carl Sagan, because it sort of gives us the challenge in front of us. Sagan says, in order to make an apple pie, you must first invent the universe. There's some, there's some communication theory uh, dissertation waiting to be written about why the inclusion of a picture of an apple pie serves any purpose whatsoever in a talk like this. You know what apple pies look like, but it's nice to see the picture there. Too. So what does Sagan mean by this? There's sort of the trivial notion, of course, that without the universe at all, there wouldn't be any apple pies, that is true. But there's a slightly deeper meaning. If you want to make an apple pie, I believe the logic goes, you need apples, you need pie crust, you need sugar, etc. But that means you need apple orchards, you need sugar plantations and wheat fields, and that means you need the earth and a biosphere and the sun, and that means you need the Milky Way and the universe and the Big Bang. That might be what your logic is anyway, but that logic is not correct. In the Boltzmann-Lucretia scenario, if you have a randomly fluctuating equilibrium ensemble of matter, the way to get an apple pie is just to wait. <laughs> you sit in thermal equilibrium and wait for the apple pie to come in front of you. <laughs> Most apple pies are like that. They do not get associated with wheat fields and apple orchards and so forth. But we think in our universe, the existence of apple pies is predicated on the existence of apple orchards and biospheres and so forth. So what we want to look for are what we might call Sagan universes. Universes in which, when there is an apple pie, there was an apple orchard and a biosphere, etc. When you see a low entropy state, on one side of time it is higher entropy, but on the other side of time it is lower entropy. There is a long, smooth, monotonic change in the entropy of the universe. As cosmologists, we need to invent a scenario in which that happens. Now, people, including myself, have made efforts to do it. I want to tell you just about one possible way, one option. And that is that the universe is eternal, which means that the Big Bang, which Boltzmann didn't know about, was not the beginning of time. We don't know whether it is or not. But that there was more universe before the Big Bang with the special property that if we are here, entropy is increasing upward if time goes up and down. Entropy is increasing that way, but it also is increasing that way once you get down far enough. But the arrow of time points in one direction toward what we call the future, but if you go far enough into the past, the arrow of time points the other way. So that the whole shebang is symmetric with respect to time. That might be a nice thing to shoot for, but how do you actually make it happen in a natural way? So our suggestion, and by this I mean me and Jennifer Chen, who was a graduate student I worked with, was to use baby universes. This is an unabashedly speculative part of the idea, but you know that general relativity says space and time are flexible, dynamical, they change in, in uh, response to the influence of matter and energy. Quantum mechanics says that you can't pin down classical looking systems to particular configurations. They will fluctuate around. So if you believe both of those at the same time, it is natural to believe that space itself will occasionally sort of fluctuate a little bit, have a little dimple. And if you wait a long enough time, occasionally those dimples will sort of pinch off and go their own way. 
And you can solve equations for this. It happens rarely, but there's a non-zero chance in simple models that will actually happen. So what you have are more or less spherical blobs of the universe. Usually, they will just collapse to a point, and that will be the end of it. But if the conditions are right, you can get inflation in such a little spherical blob of the universe. And that little blob can expand to make a universe with hundreds of billions of galaxies. A universe with 10 to the 88 photons and particles like we seem to have in ours. So the point is that from emptiness, empty space, you can make a little bubble that is a baby universe that expands in exactly the way that our universe seems to have evolved. These baby universes naturally begin small and dense and smooth because small baby universes are easier to make than large ones. Dense and smooth ones will survive, while underdense or wrinkly ones will just collapse. There's a selection effect, once again, that the kinds of universes you will find yourself in naturally look like they came from something like a low entropy Big Bang. But along the way, you're not ever decreasing the entropy of anything. You're taking the original universe you started with and adding the entropy of a whole new universe to it. So the entropy of the multiverse increases in this model forever and ever. And the best part of it is, like I said, you can play this game in both directions of time. So imagine that we begin here in the middle, and time is the vertical axis. You have an empty, quiet, parent universe, and it just evolves upward, upward, according to the laws of physics. And there's some chance, some probability, per unit space-time volume, that you pinch off a little baby universe, which then expands, cools, and, and entropy increases, and structure grows, and there's an arrow of time. Eventually, it will cool off, and it will be empty and quiet, and it will have its own children. And like in the real world, the various children never talk to their parents or each other. There's no communication between the baby universes in this scenario. Plus, we can tell the same story downward in the diagram. You start with empty, quiet, parent universe, you go downward. The fundamental laws of physics, as we've said from the beginning, don't have pay any difference to the past versus the future. They don't treat them any differently. So if there are nucleations of baby universes and arrows of time going up this way, there will be the same thing going down that way. There will be people living in this baby universe who call this the future and say that we are in their past. We call this the future and say that they are in our past. The situation is completely symmetric. The people down here have an arrow of time that is reversed by our standards. But locally, within this little baby universe, nobody sees scrambled eggs unscrambling or coffee and cream unmixing. They just say that this was the low entropy direction of time, and this is the higher entropy direction. They think that our arrow of time is backward. The whole multiverse is symmetric with respect to time. So the nice thing about this is that the arrow of time is not put in. The whole shebang is symmetric with respect to time. The increase of entropy is a natural feature because in this model, entropy can always increase. You do not hit thermal equilibrium and fluctuate like in Boltzmann's model. You just increase and change forever. And the life of the universe is one of eternal change. Now, we invoke baby universes make this happen. Those may or may not be possible. We haven't made one in the lab yet. I don't know whether anyone has. I have not seen that happen. But it's a proof, at least by construction, that we can imagine models in which we didn't cheat by making the universe low entropy at any moment. The entropy of the universe can always go up because there is no bound on it. And the fact that entropy is changing dramatically in our local region is explained rather than postulated. So once we do that, either with this model or with some other model, that's when we will finally understand the arrow of time. So, this is the conclusion. I want you to keep two things in mind. There are two lessons for the whole talk. One is that there's a lot we do understand about entropy and the arrow of time. We understand why entropy is increasing, given the past hypothesis. We understand how that increase of entropy can help explain memory and aging and causality and things like that. The second thing is there's something really big and hugely important that we don't understand in modern cosmology. Why the universe started in this low entropy state. Inflation by itself does not explain it. Quantum cosmology models may or may not explain it. I think it's 
fair to say that over 99% of cosmological models on the market today do not explain this or even attempt to explain it. So when you hear anybody but me give a talk about cosmology, they claim to have a theory of the whole universe, demand that they explain why the early universe has low entropy. Very optimistic that this is something that will be explained in my lifetime, maybe by somebody in this room. So I look forward to coming back and hearing you give a talk and me listen, and we have it all finally figured out. Thank you. Most important. 
And Hawking calculated the area of the entropy of a black hole is the area in Planck units. So that turns out if you have a 1 million solar mass black hole, the entropy of a 1 million solar mass black hole is 10 to the 90th. So our galaxy has a black hole in the middle that is several million solar masses. So the entropy of the black hole at the center of our galaxy is larger than the entropy of all of the non-black hole particles in the universe. So today, the entropy of the universe is dominated by all the black holes. And if you add it up, it's a number about 10 to the 103. And then you can say, how big can it possibly get? That's another thing, the sitter space, blah, 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 blah. The answer is about 10 to the 123. So the, on the slide with the baby universes, the parent universe seemed to be increasing in entropy in both directions. How is that possible? Well, why not? <laughs> so remember, uh, so, so for one thing, it's not actually true. It's not actually a parent universe has constant entropy up and down. I've drawn it so that it looks physically bigger, but that's a trick of sort of non-Euclidean geometry being projected onto the board. There's a slightly more sophisticated story we need to tell about how to calculate the entropy of this curve expanding space-time. This is the universe, a universe with nothing in it but vacuum energy, is secretly a stationary universe. There's a coordinate system in which it looks like it's expanding, but there's another coordinate system in which it looks like it's not expanding at all. And the proper way to think about the entropy of the space-time is as constant. Okay. The whole thing from here has entropy going up in that direction and in that direction. So if you plotted entropy versus time, it would look like this. And that's because our law, the second law of thermodynamics, is just a little snapshot of a tiny little piece of the universe in which entropy is dramatically increasing. But the fact that the entropy goes like this is perfectly consistent with everything we know about the system and All right, where did the microphone go? Over there, good. Did you talk about the allows of time being different in different entropy universes? That does that technically mean that these are different errors of time so we can't really observe because we can only observe the past from our error of time's perspective? Well, again, I would say yes and no. So the question is, like, we can only see the past in some sense. So if we're here and the arrow of time is reversed somewhere else, can we not see it? So there's a sense in which, like a technical sense in which the answer is yes. It is impossible for an event here to propagate through the universe all the way up here for us to see it. But that's a trivial fact because we came out of a big universe nucleation event here which looks like the Big Bang. So nothing about the past before the Big Bang can ever sort of leak through in terms of imagery or records or telescopic observations from here to there. So even without subtleties about entropy and information, you can't see what happened before the Big Bang. So on your uh, so mini baby universes, they yeah. look yeah, you know, there's a, there's a family of these elements. In this picture, the question is, is there a relationship between these baby universes and black holes? If you were standing outside, if you're an observer out here, so you were not going to go into the baby universe, you are standing in the external space time. What it would look like to you is that quantum fluctuations brought together particles that made a black hole, which then quickly evaporated. So in that sense, it kind of looks like a black hole from the outside, a tiny black hole, a tiny mass sized black hole. So if that happened in this room right now, it could happen, it's possible. The energy released would be about that of a grenade going off. So you don't want the baby universe to be created right here in the room. But it's not really a black hole in the sense that it's an intrinsic quantum mechanical nature to this tunneling event that you really can't associate a smooth classical space line with the whole thing all the time. So that's why I'm saying there's a resemblance, but they're not quite the same. Certainly, sorry, there's no reason to expect that inside every black hole lurks a baby universe. No reason to think that. That would be crazy. In your baby universe where time is proceeding from what we would call the past, yeah. and in the one where inflation starts in the other universe, Oh, that's a very good question, and the answer is I have no idea. So the question is, we live in a universe where there's more matter than antimatter. 
more uh, protons and neutrons, baryons, than there are antiprotons and antineutrons, antineutrons. Uh, how fortunate it is that we live in a universe where it's more baryons than antibaryons, huh? So, of course, we name the protons to be whatever we actually observe. But we don't know why. We don't know why there is this imbalance. We don't know why it went the way it did. Is it possible that the thermodynamic arrow of time is somehow connected to that imbalance? Yes. Can I say that it is connected? No. Sure. However, it is very, very possible that the imbalance between matter and antimatter in every one of these universes is a random number. And it's a random number going back to it. We just don't know. Hi, I'm not quite sure if I uh, was confused from a previous question. But so with the parent universes, there's no direction, there's no arrow of time. So why do the uh, maybe universes have a specific direction? Ah, very good. So. Here, if you were living here, if you were a grown-up person living in this world, it would just be empty space, it would be thermal equilibrium, there would be no arrow of time. Locally, it is just like you're in thermal equilibrium. And you would think that there's no way for anything to happen in one direction rather than the other. But secretly, you're in sort of a local maximum of entropy, not a global maximum. There is a hidden way for the entropy of this universe to increase Namely, by making maybe universes. So you're not really in a maximum entropy state, even though it looks that way locally. You can give off maybe universes and increase the entropy of the whole shebang. So you could, one way of asking your question or thinking about it is, if going from here upward, you can spit off, emit baby universes, couldn't you also absorb a baby universe as going in the opposite direction of time? And the answer is yes, but there you would think that was less likely because that's an entropy decreasing process rather than an entropy increasing one. Because this universe has some value of entropy, and that value can always go up by giving off baby universes, that is what will happen for a large probability. Yeah. Would baby universes get all their energy from the parent universe, or how would you reconciliate the conservation of energy? Yes, conservation of energy is a wonderful question because I know the answer to that one. So <laughs> it turns out that the idea of energy is a subtle one in general relativity, Einstein's theory of curves is based on it. You, there is no formula for the energy located in a region of space, but there is a formula for the energy of the whole universe all at once. And if that universe is closed, if it's something like a sphere or a three-dimensional version of a sphere, that formula is unambiguous. The total energy equals zero. Total electric charge equals zero. The total of every conserved quantity in this little baby universe is exactly zero. You can very, very informally think of that as saying that the energy in matter and radiation and stuff is positive. The energy in the curvature of space-time is negative and exactly cancels. So the nice thing about this whole, one of the nice things, one of the many, many nice things about this whole thing is that Energy is totally conserved, you can make an infinite number of universes doing it. You don't have just a finite amount of room to go. Um, so, this may just be me that misunderstanding, or it may just be um, something else. Is the idea that potentially baby universes can split off of their initial universe, can potentially split other baby universes off of them? And if so, is the idea that there is one central, original ancestor universe um, before all the rest of the universe? So yes and yes, that is the idea. There are, these universes can eventually have their own babies. The way that I drew it, there is a single universe at this moment in time. But it's up to you if you want to imagine initial conditions that have many, many more initial universes. As long as it's a finite number, they will have this generic behavior. They're going to make more universes for both the past and the future. So I think it's robust to that. Yes. I was wondering, uh, I've read about some experiments that make it seem like the, the future can affect the past, like some version of the double slit experiment. Right. When the electrons seem to know right. what's happened in the future <coughs> part of the experiment, and then I can change the previous part of the experiment. Plus, I've read some other experiment that I can't remember where, where it did to prove that the future, the past can be affected by the future. Yes. Can you talk about that? 
So I think what it means is that you've learned that reading is dangerous. <laughs> because you can read all sorts of nonsense that isn't true. And I know what you've read. I know there are, there's something called the delayed choice experiment in quantum mechanics. So you can take in quantum mechanics, we have a world where things that you think of as real and things that you perceive as observational outcomes, like the particle is spinning clockwise, or the particle is spinning counterclockwise, or the particles over here or over there. Quantum mechanics says that the world exists in a superposition of all those things happening at once. And the delayed choice experiments are ones, I, I won't go through the whole details, but you start somewhere, you go through some complicated configuration where the system is doing different things, and then at the end you make an observation and how you talk about what happened in the middle is affected by what observation you made. So in some sense, by making a choice later, you affect what happened before you made that choice. Again, I can't go through the details. It's just that is a really, really bad way of talking about something that is very, very simple. <laughs> and it's simple if and only if you think the world is fundamentally described by that quantum mechanical wave function not by particles that are truly spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, going through one slit or the other. So typically, this kind of thought experiment has a, an electron going through, maybe it goes to the left slit or the right slit. If you don't observe it, it looks like it interferes. By observing it in a certain way, you can sort of decide whether it went through one slit or the other. If you're, that only, that only makes sense if you think there is something called the electron that either does go through the slits or doesn't, if you think there is something called the wave function of the electron, it evolves perfectly happy forward in time without any spooky influences going backward. So I think that these descriptions of the delayed choice experiment as information or influence propagating backward in time are just pernicious misreadings of the rules of quantum mechanics. You can tell them I said so. <laughs> I had a question, a follow-up question yeah. about what was asked earlier about, um, um, I think he, he uh, talked about a local, local uh, maximum entropy. Uh, yeah. Does that, so what, happened, what happens in the case of the 10th ten, of the Google years? Yeah. Um, and I guess this relates to vacuum energy. Does, does vacuum energy dissipate? And in that situation, are there still those fluctuations? Good. This is a very good question. And, and this, I mean the opposite of what I meant before. I mean, I still know the answer to this one, but I was wrong about it for years. So the simple part is, no, vacuum energy does not dissipate. We think that vacuum energy is an inherent feature of space itself. It is the answer to the question, how many herbs of energy are there in every cubic centimeter of space, even if there's nothing else in there? No particles, no forces, no, no anything. And we think the answer is 10 to the minus 8 herbs in every cubic centimeter of space. It's not a lot of herbs, but the universe is big. There's many cubic centimeters. So this vacuum energy dominates the universe. So we think the universe will just be pushed apart by vacuum energy forever, for infinity years. right? So you might ask, well, what happens during those empty years where there's nothing going on, the dark, dark, dark ages of the universe's history? For a long time, people believed the following thing. Stephen Hawking said in the 1970s that black holes give off radiation. They have a temperature. If you live in a universe with a non-zero vacuum energy, it's kind of like a black hole, except we're inside the horizon rather than outside looking at it. Universes that are accelerating, universes with vacuum energy in them, also have a temperature. They also are filled with radiation. So it's like a box of gas with radiation in it that lasts forever, which is exactly like Boltzmann's universe. So the idea was that in what we call de Sitter space, in a universe with nothing but vacuum energy in it, if you wait long enough, there will be fluctuations out of the nothingness, out of the quantum vacuum, into low entropy states like Boltzmann brain. So, like I said, cosmologists used to believe that up until a couple of years ago, and now only 99.9% .9 of cosmologists believe it because I figured out that they were wrong. <laughs> they hadn't listened to me yet. This seems to be the theme of all the questions that people don't listen to me. But 
That story of fluctuations in empty space was again, it turns out, a misunderstanding of the difference between quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics is we don't know where these particles are, they're bumping into each other, they will occasionally fluctuate. Quantum mechanics says it's not that we don't know where things are, it's that they really have a wave function that is spread out. And just as the other questioner uh, led us to, to talk about, in the sitter space, in empty space, it's secretly stationary. It's secretly not evolving at all. Likewise, the quantum state is secretly not evolving at all either, or even not so secretly. There's literally nothing happening in this empty the sitter phase with nothing but vacuum energy. In particular, there are no fluctuations into anything. So there will be no Boltzmann brains, no random civilizations coming into existence. So we think that the story that we tell of the usual cosmological evolution from here to here, this is the only part of the history of our universe which was hospitable to the existence of life. Um, could you emphasize for me the difference between waiting for the apple pie to form on its own and waiting for a baby universe to form to make it? Good. That's a very good question. That sort of gets to the heart of why uh, my theory is awesome. <laughs> so my skills and PowerPoint do something to use. Okay. The point is that uh yeah, I broke one. Okay, there we go. Um in this scenario, if we're right, it turns out it's way easier to make a universe than to make an apple pie. That sounds wrong. But this is the miracle of general relativity. Remember general relativity, the energy of this little thing is zero. Right? The energy of natural pi is not zero. This is the whole universe all at once. And we can start very, very small. Inflationary cosmology, which again, a whole other lecture we didn't get a chance to see. But in inflation, this little tiny bubble of the universe is filled with a temporarily huge amount of vacuum energy. It's not huge by absolute standards, but the density is very, very large. The echo volume is very small. So because it's vacuum energy, even as that little bubble starts small, as it expands, the energy density remains constant. So volume goes up, density remains constant, the total amount of stuff in this universe grows arbitrarily large. So you can make all the apple pies you want. Tens of billions of apple pies will be made. But the probability of making this little thing to start with is way higher than the probability of making apple pie, just because it's smaller and quantum fluctuations like to be small rather than being big. I think we have our last question here. And, uh, and afterwards, if you had a question you can uh, get to, please come down and uh, maybe uh, Professor Carroll can answer it for you directly. Last question, it better be good. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I would like to go back to the situation you described where the universe would be formed of only black holes. Right. So in this situation, these black holes would probably attract each other because that's the way in which uh, entropy would grow because the reason they have two black holes when they join would be larger and both separated and we sort of know that the force that is behind this is gravity but if you assume that uh, the increment of entropy is fundamental then you could argue that these two that these black holes just attract each other because entropy has to grow so wouldn't gravity appear to be something like redundant or not necessary? So it turns out, I mean, it's a very good question, but the numbers don't back you up. If the universe is big and expanding, then black holes that are close enough to each other will attract and join. But black holes that are too far away will just drift apart forever and ever. In an accelerating universe, there's a horizon. There's a certain size, and if you're separated by more than that size, you will never come together no matter how long you wait. So there's only a finite region of space in which black holes will come together. And when they come together, the entropy goes up. That is true. But then those black holes evaporate, and you can calculate the entropy of the photons into which they evaporate. It is bigger than the entropy of the black hole was. So the configuration that maximizes the entropy has no black holes in it. It is empty space, everything dispersed to the four winds. A lonely, desolate, cold, and ever forbidding universe. A wonderful place to end our lecture tonight. <laughs> Thank you.